um, it's actually this topic in particular that moved me into taking more action around climate change and to join for our kids. Uh, my journey started with looking for answers uh, to some health challenges that my kids and I were experiencing. And along that journey, I became aware that the food we were eating, even though it would be considered a very healthy, healthy diet by most, was no longer providing the same medicinal and nutritional qualities as the same food grown, grown even a generation ago. And not only that, some of it was actually even harmful to our health by the way it was grown. Around this time, our presenters tonight introduced me to the work of Dr. Zach Bush and other proponents of regenerative agriculture. And by listening to these experts, I began to see the connection between the degradation of our soil through practices like using glyphosate and other chemicals on our crops and the acceleration of climate change. And it was that understanding that led me to join um, our North Shore for our kids chapter. And although when I look at the current trajectory of climate change, I can become discouraged. I am excited for the role that regenerative agriculture can play as a solution to this. And that we as individuals can make a difference by employing some of the methods we're gonna hear about tonight actually. And on that note, on to why you've come. Well, in 2005, Jackie Bradley and Phil Gregory retired to Bowen Island. Jackie started a garden with no experience, but the conviction of growing organically. She had wonderful crops for several years, regularly adding lime and organic fertilizers, but 10 years down the road, she was not producing anywhere near the quantity or quality of food that she once had. This coincided with her husband, Phil, reading a UN announcement in Scientific American. This article changed their lives. Phil, who is a retired UBC professor in astrophysics, decided to investigate this UN statement, which you'll hear more about in, the, in his presentation, and to see what could be done. In what has mushroomed into a six-year journey into agriculture, soil biology, human health, and climate change, he is now convinced that there is a solution to food security, climate change, and many human health issues, and has recently published a book on his journey called Pathway to Regeneration. They are now busy, busy applying these regenerative principles along with Jackie's permaculture training in their garden, as well as a thriving community garden and place for regenerative education on the island. They will share some of what they're learning and applying with us tonight. So over to Jackie and Phil. Okay, now I'm gonna share my screen. And um, you're gonna get the scientist first and then the gardener at the end. Uh, okay, Phil, take it All away. Right. Well, hi everybody. Um, uh, nice to see some fresh faces and some familiar ones. And um, I want to start by thanking you all for giving us this opportunity to talk to you tonight. We just love what you're all about and hope that our own journey can support yours. So let's go on to the next slide. Jackie, you're going to be advancing those. Uh, why is it not working? <laughs> Sorry, this is the first time we've ever done a presentation over Zoom. Uh, we practiced this and it forwarded. I'm going to stop share and just load it again. Okay, this is fine the way it is. I think. But it's not doing oh. it. Oh, you have to, if you load it again, you have to go to the. Um, uh, uh, you have to do that one page thing, right? Yeah, but it didn't allow me to do that. Okay, well, let's try again. Oh, here we go. Let's see if there. Come on. Yeah. And it went directly to, oh, for heaven's sakes. Okay, I may have to scroll it. Yeah. Okay, sorry, guys. Okay, well. This is that famous announcement by the United Nations in 2014 that really rocked my boat. Only 60 years of farming left if soil, soil degradation continues. In 2017, the UK Environment Minister announced that they had only 30 to 40 years 
of soil fertility left. So the best guess is that we've got something less than 60 and maybe a little less than 30 is the, the range. That's not very long. Okay, so let's go on to the next slide. Here's another way of looking at soil degradation. For every ton of food produced, we lose seven tons of soil. Imagine, one ton of food, seven tons of soil gone off into the rivers, lakes, and onto the ocean. Next. So what are the primary causes of soil degradation? Well, one of the big ones is plowing or tilling. Another one is chemical intensive farming, where we use fertilizers, fossil fuel-based fertilized, or fertilizers and fossil fuel-based pesticides. And then there's livestock management, uh, urban sprawl, deforestation, and industry. Now, I'd like to say a few words, first of all, about plowing. In the last 30 years, we've learned some amazing things, that nature evolved a barter system between plants and soil microbes. These microbes make amazing glues that they use to build soil structure that prevent soil erosion. So they literally glue together the um, mineral substrate particles, uh, organic particles, and they create air spaces, which can be uh, used to store water and, and air. So this structure allows air and water to infiltrate, and this reduces droughts and floods. Plowing destroys soil structure, turning living soil into dirt that is easily eroded away. Did you, were you aware that certain fungal microbes operate a very sophisticated underground internet that allows plants to share signals and nutrients? This fungal network is absolutely shredded by the plow, shutting down cooperation between plants. The other thing I want to talk about is uh, fertilizers. The soil microbes carry out the world's largest mining and recycling operation, provide all the essential trace elements that plants need to grow strong and healthy. With a healthy population of microbes, there's no need for artificial fossil fuel-based fertilizers. However, um, plants become addicted to readily accessible artificial nitrogen fertilizer and stop releasing sugars through their roots to attract and feed the microbes. This shuts down nature's barter system. In addition, long-term use of nitrogen fertilizers has also been shown to reduce the soil organic carbon and soil fertility. So it turns out, and we didn't know this 30 or 40 years ago, that we couldn't continue to keep using nitrogen fertilizers without uh, degrading the soil progressively. That only showed up in the 1990s. And since then, we've seen declines in the productivity using that technique. Pesticides. Here's a few comments about pesticides. Glyphosate is possibly the worst of the agricultural chemicals. It is the active ingredient in Roundup, which many of you will have heard about, and the most heavily used agricultural chemical in the world. It's a powerful herbicide that kills any plant that has not been genetically modified. And in addition, it is a powerful antibiotic. This is not so well known. So it can decimate soil microbes as well as the beneficial human gut microbes. And finally, uh, let me say just a word about livestock management. I could easily give a whole lecture on the powerful role that nature evolved for herbivores and how badly we have mismanaged them. It's not the cow that's the problem. It's how we're managing them. Properly managed, they are perhaps our most powerful ally in mitigating climate change, but this is really not well appreciated at all. Okay, let's go on now to the next slide. So I decided to use my 50 years of research experience to investigate what if anything could be done about the various existential threats we face, starting with the looming collapse of agriculture, but not neglecting at all climate change. 
Along the way, I was guided by these two famous quotes. We can't solve problems by using the same kind of thinking we used when we created them. Clearly, one has to look for outliers when you're doing any investigation. If we just stick to the mainstream, we're not gonna get any fresh ideas. People are fed by the food industry, which pays no attention to health and are treated by the health industry, which pays no attention to food. That is so true. As I've walked through this investigation, uh, I, this is being reinforced time and time again. So uh, that is one of the big, big things that we have to, to recognize. Okay. Well, the good news from my six year investigation is if we change the way we do agriculture in response to a recent revolution in cell biology or soil biology, we can one, reverse soil degradation and avoid the collapse of agriculture. Two, reduce chronic disease epidemics. And three, go a long way to solving global warming. And as with every, any presentation like this, we also need to reinforce the fact that we've got to rapidly reduce fossil fuel emissions. All of these things are connected and the solution may not be that expensive as nature can do a lot of the work. The real challenge is to re-educate ourselves in the limited time frame available. Here are some of the many silos of knowledge I investigated by following the connections. I started with industrial agriculture in 2015. Then I encountered an amazing revolution in soil biology and then moved on to some big surprises about cows and grazing and the great value of regenerative agriculture. Next, the importance of biology in mitigating climate change. We don't really think of biology as being crucial to climate change. The disaster of agricultural chemicals on human health. The importance of biodiversity and respect for complexity. And finally, I came to the conclusion that as humans, we need to become team nature players. Nature has the solutions. We just have to be open to using them. Okay, so I think we'll stop the screen share right now because I, there's a powerful video on the connection between all of these aspects, all, all aspects of this work. And it's about three and a half minutes and Marion is going to put that on for us. This is by a group called Kiss the Ground. I'll have a little bit more to say about them. If you're like most people, you're probably feeling a little hopeless about climate change and the damage we've done to our planet. Well, now there's a new way to look at climate change and how to deal with it that might just turn that hopelessness into hope. Climate change, as we know, is all about too much carbon in our atmosphere. But carbon is not our enemy. It's the building block of life. Everything alive is made of it, even us. The problem and the solution are simply a matter of balance. Let's step back and look at the five pools where carbon is stored on planet Earth. Starting about 500 million years ago, when plants first appeared on land, carbon began to cycle in an amazing balance between these pools, a balance that allowed for life as we know it to evolve. Then one life form, that would be us, figured out how to extract carbon from the fossil pool, which was pretty much a timeout zone for carbon. We've been burning it for energy, putting into play, and disrupting that balance. The way we manage land and do agriculture is moving even more carbon into the atmosphere. Specifically, we've moved 880 billion tons of carbon dioxide into the atmosphere, which is heating up the planet and destabilizing our climate. The oceans have absorbed a lot of this excess carbon, throwing off the ocean's balance, resulting in ocean acidification and accelerating a mass extinction of sea life. So in order to save life as we know it, of course we need to stop burning fossil carbon. The big question is, where do we put this excess carbon to get the cycle back in balance? 
The good news is that the answer is literally right under our feet. It's the soil. Plants, using sunlight and water, naturally perform photosynthesis. They pull carbon in from the air and turn it into carbohydrates, sugars. Then they pump some of these sugars down through the roots to feed microorganisms who use that carbon to build healthy soil. Voila, carbon moved. The plants pump it in and the soil stores it. Nature's living technology is amazing. Scientists have recently discovered that applying a thin layer of compost can help regenerate healthy soil, setting up an ongoing feedback loop that brings more and more carbon into the soil each year. Together with other regenerative practices, like not tilling the soil, planting trees and cover crops, and planned grazing, we can build and retain billions of tons of soil carbon. This is carbon farming. This is regenerative agriculture. Unlike more carbon in the atmosphere, more carbon in the ground is good for us. It makes healthy soil, which is nutrient rich and full of life and holds way more water. This means more nutritious food and crops that are more resilient in the face of drought. That's good news for farmers, families, and everyone who eats. Remember this, the way we grow our food, fiber, and fuel either puts carbon up into our atmosphere or pulls it down into the ground. The regeneration of soil is the task of our generation. Our health, the health of our soils, and the health of our planet are one and the same. Okay, well, thank you, Marion. Um, I hope you enjoyed that. Uh, it does a uh, absolutely delicious job of putting so many things together and giving a good perspective. Um, but along that lines, I also want to advertise some excellent animations that you can watch with your kids to learn more about the soil food web and soil microbes. These were produced by Dr. Elaine Ingham, who's one of the power pioneering uh, researchers in the field of soil biology, uh, pioneering this revolution that I've been referring to. Okay, let's go to the next slide. So um, I've been on this six-year journey. Clearly, I've gone into a lot of things. Um, the book that I've written has something like 261 references, a lot of them being scientific, and many very exciting discoveries. And a short presentation like this, I can't possibly tell you um, even a fraction of the important things that I learned. So I, what I thought I'd try and do here is take the, the biggest insight that I came, that, that occurred to me throughout this work and see if I could summarize it in a couple of paragraphs. So here is the key insight. Industrial agriculture is all about using technology to subdue nature. To grow our food, we go to war with nature. But since humans are a part of nature, we are harming ourselves. The way we manage our technology is creating the very exist ex existential problems we currently face. Let me repeat that. The way we manage our technology is creating the existential problems we currently face. They are giant unintended consequences. I found that nature has the solutions. We just need to appreciate her complexity. Some of this complexity has become clear in the last 30 years, which is what I've been sharing in the Magic of Soil videos and talks. It has a lot to do with the invisible world of soil microbes and their relationship to plants and animals, including humans. It's basically a good news story, but not one that is widely appreciated. We need to become team nature players and take up the solutions nature is offering. And the beauty of what is being offered is that nature's workforce can do a lot of that work for us. All right, let's move on here. My major finding is that regenerative agriculture offers the way forward for humanity. And here is my definition. 
Regenerative agriculture is all about cooperating with nature's amazing workforce to restore degraded soil, sequester atmospheric carbon, and grow more nutritious food. In 2017, we started to share some of the lessons we had learned with our local community on Bowen Island. We formed the Bowen Island Food Resilience Society, or BIFS, with six other very dedicated islanders. One of the developers on island wants to donate about four acres of agricultural land for a community garden, which we have been managing for about a year now. We also have initiatives in both garden and municipal composting and have been working on a cosmetic pesticide ban for Bowen. Already 44 BC municipalities, including North Vancouver, already have cosmetic pesticide bans, but as an incorporated island, we are not part of any of that. So it's very important that we catch up on that score. So here is a drone aerial view of uh, the Grafton Agricultural Commons. And uh, we're, we're, what we're developing here is a demonstration re regenerative agricultural garden. So what you can see is about three quarters of an acre. Uh, and you, at the very top, there's a, a series of box, there's some boxes for a box garden. And then the biggest thing we're doing is a little over a quarter of an acre is that giant square with a circle in the center. And we just uh, took over the management of this garden uh, not quite a year ago now. So we ha already had a, a very good first crop and uh, um, managed to generate a lot of food, which uh, some of what we sold and some of what we gave to um, the food bank. And the money that we raised, we then donated that to the food bank as well and one other charity. So we're now into our second year. Uh, this slide shows one of the uh, fundraisers that we're carrying out. Um, we need a lot of organic straw and so do other islanders. And so twice a year, we bring in a whole truckload of organic straw. And when Jackie first started doing this, because this was her brainwave, I thought it was crazy. But anyway, she went ahead and I, I supported her eventually. <laughs> uh, it took about four months to, to sell all the straw. But this time around, uh, it was all sold before the truck arrived. So um, there's really a growing demand. That's something else we've noticed is that uh, during this period of COVID, there seems to be a great increase in the number of people wanting to have their own garden. Well, this just shows uh, some of the uh, composting and uh, soil microbe studies that we're doing. Um, and we're being quite ambitious about this. Uh, not everybody is going to want to learn how to identify soil microbes with a microscope or make their own compost. And uh, in North Vancouver, you're blessed to have uh, an expert on this topic who has her own little company and uh, she will provide any of those services you would like. She's a professional uh, on, uh, as a soil food web consultant. So there's her information. And with that, I think, uh, oh yes, I have, uh, want to give you this resource page. So this is my UBC website. Uh, if you go to that uh, link, you can click on recent presentations and recent videos. And one of the things you'll find is a, a book that you can download for free, which is uh, our Hugo Culture book. And uh, you'll see things like the magic of soil and all kinds of other educational uh, posters and things. So um, let me get to the last of my slides, which is my new book. Pathway to Regeneration. And uh, you'll soon be able to buy this online, but at the moment we have some advanced copies that are available for $28 as a fundraiser for BIFs. And uh, Jill Kennedy uh, has agreed to uh, hand those out. Uh, all you need to do is contact her and that's her email. Okay, so with that, I will really turn it over to my partner. Okay. I'm going to stop the share and do an
the new share. Uh, view. Oh, okay. Okay, so um, Phil and I are, have already given these PDFs to for our kids, so um, you'll get a copy of them uh, and um, some information to go with it. So basically, I'm going to very quickly um, run through this because we're almost out of time. So this is my vegetable garden. You wouldn't know it, would you, by looking at it, but the reason I'm showing this as my vegetable garden is because in a vegetable garden, um, crucial, absolutely crucial is diversity. So you have to have flowers as well as vegetables and uh, they also attract beneficial insects which really help the soil health. I'm getting, so now I'm just gonna run through without saying anything about them, but the notes that I send with this will tell you some more things about these plants. But these are some things that from a permaculture point of view and a regenerative point of view are good plants to have in regenerative garden. So comfrey, hairy vetch, that's the, the uh, thing going up the fence with the purple flowers. And in front of it is cardoon, which is related to an artichoke, except it's not edible. And here at the bottom under the cartoon, that's what the flower looks like. Lupins, yarrow, you can see the bees like the yarrow, or actually that's probably a wasp, a sunflowers, borage. Cover crops are extremely important uh, in a regenerative garden. So in this case here, you can see oats, that, that grain coming up at the, in the center there. And it's, it's actually a beautiful grain, so it, it really provides beauty to the garden as well. Then some other cover crops are barley and buckwheat. And left-hand corner there, the grain is barley, the white flower is buckwheat. And then crimson clover, and look how beautiful that is. Um, it's uh, fantastic. And white mustard, amazing, called white mustard even though it's yellow. Um, here's a purple sprouting winter broccoli, so it's good to have things that will grow in the winter as well. Um, this is a, a heritage vegetable, and it's a, the, you eat the root and see these little funny looking sort of ginger-like things like a Michelin man, that's what you eat out of that plant. Um, sea kale, that's another perennial. Um, scarab, another perennial, which is also an, an ancient food, which used to be a potato. Before we had potatoes, that's what people ate. Then here's just a quick little synopsis of our hugel culture, because that's part of, we have two gardens, and that's a major part of one of the gardens, and just showing it being built. Hugel culture is about burying wood, so this is sort of the major project. You can simply put twigs in the ground and put soil over them. And the purpose of having wood um, <clears throat> under your soil or in your soil is the wood holds onto and stores water. So it soaks it all up in the rainy season. And then it, it provides, uh, over time, it provides it back to the plants growing there. Um, and also as the logs decompose, they feed the microbes and they feed the soil. Uh, so then down in the bottom is, this is what it looked, and top left is what it looked like in April. Top right, by the end of May, it was all complete. And by August, this is what it looked like. And uh, the, one of the things I've learned is that the squashes and um, berries, they love the hugel because it kind of has high fungal content. All right, now, sort of the, the major piece here is our five principles of soil health, which are five of the major principles of regenerative agriculture. So the first one is armor the soil surface. And as you can see here, I have straw all over the soil. And the reason you must keep the soil covered at all times, it's really important for soil health. Nature always works to do this. You never see, um, 
nature, except if it's been disturbed by man, man, that it's, um, it's always covered. It covers it. Leaves fall on the ground, twigs fall on the ground, branches fall. It doesn't have bare soil. And when you do have bare soil, one of the major things that happen is that the carbon in the soil um, connects with the oxygen, turns into carbon dioxide and goes up into the atmosphere and creates more problems for climate change. All right. Second principle, limit disturbance. So that's what Phil was talking about, plowing and tilling. So these are this is what we don't want to see, digging in the soil like this, because when you dig in the soil like this, you break up the soil structure. Now, sometimes, you know, if you're going to plant something, you have to dig, you have to make a hole. So you do have to do a little bit, but um, as limit as much as possible to anything physical, mechanical, or chemical. And you can use things like cardboard and mulch um, and follow no dig gardening. There's lots of stuff online about that. And you can build lasagna beds. There's lots of ways to do this, which I don't have time to go into. So then here's a lo lot of my seedlings ready for planting. And so I just want to show you how you can plant in a regenerative garden. So normally I try to have things growing as much as possible. So on the left hand, the top left hand corner there, there I've just cut those plants. That's a cover crop of some sort. Can't tell exactly what it is. And um, I've just cut it where the place in the place where I want to put my seedling. Then I chop it up in bits and pieces and put it on the soil where I'm gonna, I've moved back the straw a bit. So I put the green choppings on there and then I cover it back up with the mulch, the straw in this case. And then I just make a little hole just big enough for the seedling to plant in. Third principle, build diversity. Extremely important. If you haven't seen The Biggest Little Farm, watch that. It is the best movie. It's on Netflix and it just really shows this how important diversity is. So here's a little picture in my garden where you see on the left there's a broccoli right next to it is a chard and next to that is a cabbage and then all around it are cover crops so that's kind of what my garden looks like and fourth principle keep living roots in the soil because it's the relationship between the microbes in the soil and the plant that keeps the soil healthy and they need roots in the soil to be able to survive the microbes do so this is a photo of um, after this, uh, an early crop that came out of these places, they were all planted with cover crops, which will, some of them will last all the way through the winter and some of them part way through the winter. And five, the last principle here is integrate animals into your space. Don't be worried about animals coming in. Sometimes you know, like this towhee that's in the middle here, who is actually my favorite visitor to the garden. In the spring, the towhee just drive me crazy because as soon as I plant a seed, they're in there tossing the straw off onto the pass and eating the, eating the seeds. But they're so cheerful and uh, I don't know, I, they're perky and I love them. Uh, so basically these are all, so we have lizards and snakes in the garden. They really help with the slugs. We have frogs, butterflies, birds of various kinds, bees. Okay, got to move on fast here. We're running out of time. So here we are again. So now we're going to get to the word part. It's because these words are important. No more pictures, just words. So I'm just going to repeat these. Armor the soil surface, limit disturbance, build diversity, keep living roots in the soil and integrate animals. So now, what can you do? Really important to educate yourself and share your knowledge. So Phil talked a little bit about Kiss the Ground. It's a wonderful organization that has all sorts of educational material. Plus, it trains people to be a spokesperson for regenerative agriculture. And you don't have to have a lot of science or, or background in that kind of thing. It's really um, accessible. Visit Phil's website, which he talked about. And number two, vote with your wallet. Anytime you choose regenerative, you vote for healthy soil, nutritious food, clean air and water, and the earth. Three, 
buy local and ask if they grow regeneratively. It's kind of important to ask from my point of view if they're growing regeneratively because that's one way of sort of opening up the conversation and opening up people to the, to the fact that people are, there are people really interested in buying food that's been grown regeneratively. So in North Vancouver, I don't know if you, you probably all know about this, but just in case you don't, there's a farm called Lutet Farm. It's organic, it's not growing our, our regeneratively at the moment, but I would say that they're, you know, they're doing quite a few things that are moving in that direction. And then going to your local farmer's market, and um, also ask them how they're growing, what they're growing. Show that you're interested in how they grow things. And then finally, grow food regeneratively in your own yard. So this is just, uh, this is just for your information. This is about Kiss the Ground and how you can get involved. And um, one interesting piece about it is that they're not, this year for the first time, they've presented the teachers in the US with, um, free educational a whole bunch of free educational stuff and wouldn't it be great project for somebody here in Canada to get them to do it in Canada too uh, and then here's the information about Lutet Farm and that is it that was a rush <laughs> we do for time and, uh, Wow, that was fantastic. You covered so much ground, so many different aspects of regenerative agriculture. Thank you so much. I think you did great with the time. So uh, if anyone has any questions now, we have one question in the chat about, um, sorry, I just lost it, about where can we find sea kale or perennial kale? Um, I got that at a uh, nursery in Saanich, uh, in the Highlands, just north of Victoria, it's called EcoSense. Um, I can add, I'll just make a note to add that as a resource. And they have all sorts of wonderful um, uh, things that you can't get in many places. So one of the things they have is an almond tree, which I haven't got one yet and I really want, an almond tree that is grafted to a plum that was very successful on their property and it doesn't need huge amounts of water like almonds normally do and it grows in this part it'll grow in this part of the world so uh, so can i ask a question mm -hmm. yeah i'm very curious like so so just given what tractor tractory we're on so we don't have much time left to change our farming practices and now what are you seeing what kind of uptake is that i had read somewhere that larger corporations now were doing pilots with regenerative agriculture what's um mm -hmm. what's your information on that what's happening uh well yes um uh one that springs to mind is general mills that's uh, the one they are not only uh, wanting to have grass-fed beef, but they're also wanting it to be grazed uh, the way nature intended and the way that will allow a lot of carbon to be sequestered in the soil. And that uh, gives rise to a very interesting story uh, because uh, one of their competitors is Impossible Meats. You're probably aware that there are uh, some companies out there that are uh, wanting to make substitute meat from uh, soy products, basically. And so this one company um, went to a lot of trouble to genetically engineer um, uh, a particular substitute meat. And uh, they decided to hire the, the best environmental engineering company, a company called Qantas, to do a life cycle impact uh, study to find out what was the overall effect on their greenhouse gas footprint over the life cycle of producing their burgers. And they were thrilled when they got the results. So for every pound of their impossible burger, uh, they found that that produced 3.5 pounds of CO2 equivalent greenhouse gas emission, okay? Um, now, compared to conventional beef, that comes in at 33 pounds per uh, of, of, of CO2 equivalent. Uh, so they're doing much better than that. And so they started an ad campaign to beat their chest and 
and they started attacking uh, General Mills for using grass-fed beef. So this kind of irritated General Mills and they pulled out their wallet and they hired the same company. And they said, we want you to analyze the grass-fed beef that we buy from this particular farm, which does holistic grazing. And so they did that and it's a fairly lengthy process. And the upshot was that for every pound of this holistically grazed grass-fed beef, the answer for the CO2 equivalent was negative 3.5, which means that the producing that beef caused carbon to be sequestered in the soil. So now the answer is, if you want to eat an impossible burger and you want to be, you know, neutral, carbon neutral, then for every one pound you eat of impossible burger, all you have to do is eat one pound of General Mills uh, holistically grazed beef and you'll be neutral. <laughs> So I think this is super interesting because that would be so counterintuitive, right? It yeah. is. It is. It's good. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and you have me on the holistic grazing. I, I love that concept. I can do some of that too, I think. But I, yeah, I just like love the competition. And I'm just, just got to, do you have resources on that? Just, just articles that we can yeah. include? In fact, I can include, um, let me just uh, bring that up here. Um, oh, I think someone is already on it. Laurel is already on it. I see. Yeah, are. yeah, yeah, yeah. Can you share information about the study and the follow-up holistic grazing general mills? Yeah, here that's super are. interesting. Thank you. Here's, yeah, yeah. She, I think we're going to go on because there's not. Okay. So this is what it uh, looks like. Oh, but have. Oh, yes. It's, yeah, it's we can do it in the follow-up. Yeah. 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 If you send us the information, we can share it. Thank you. Okay. Um, another question is about whether you can do regenerative gardening in raised beds. Yes. Yep, you can. Um, um, and it's, it's, it's really, as long as you don't have um, plastic inside your raised bed or something like that, they, the soil in the raised bed has to be connected to the ground. So the, the, um, in the garden, we inherited the boxes which had been lined with plastic. We haven't yet managed to get rid of it, but yeah, you don't want to do that. You want to just have the, the bottom of the box be the ground. Mm -hmm. Are there any other questions? There was a question. Oh, there was a question about tell us about the animals in a farm. Regenerative meat, guess, eggs, dairy. I guess I thought that was answered by the um, grass-fed meat story. But if there's more, um, I I wrote that one. I just we always hear people saying, "Oh, we're going to save the planet because we're going to quit eating meat." But as as you already said, it's that's counterintuitive and. For example, Julia and I and her mother, we buy grass-fed beef from up country and we love it. And I, it's just hard to convince people that it, it's not doing some terrible harm and I should be eating soy burgers instead. So can you talk about that as using, you know, using the manure and you, you have a very small farm, but if, you know, on a larger scale, can't that be considered regenerative too? Absolutely. Um, uh, the, one of the key things uh, about um, uh, managing herbivores is um, the, the thing that we have not been good at at all is focusing on uh, allowing the grass to have sufficient recovery time before it's grazed again. And so one of the uh, if, you, if you look at the sort of the uh, physiology of grass, if you cut, if a cow comes along and cuts it right down to the, the ground level, uh, then the grass will start to go grow again because it's got energy stored in the roots. And, uh, but when it starts off, it's growing very slowly. So in the baby phase, it's, it's very slow growing. And then by the time it gets to the teenage phase, um, it's growing very rapidly. 
that's as most rapidly it will ever grow. And then eventually after it gets to the end of the teenage phase, it, it just stops growing. And basically then the plant starts to die and take its energy and put it into the seeds. So uh, what typically happens in the life cycle of uh, industrial produced cow these days, at, uh, the first six months of the calf's life, it will be grazed in, in, a, you know, in a fashion which we call continuous grazing. Um, so uh, what happens in continuous grazing is you have a pasture and you put, you take a book and you say, okay, this size pasture, I can put in four cows, uh, four cow-calf pairs. And they'll stay there for the season. Um, but uh, if that pasture has got a variety of grasses that they typically do, and you know, a, a wild pasture will have well over 150 to 300 uh, different types of grasses. And the cows have their favorites. And so they'll go and they'll eat their favorites uh, until they're down crop to the ground. And then they'll have to look for something else that they're not as interested in, but they've got their eyes open on that favorite because as it regrows, it becomes this succulent, nutritious, you know, very nutritious thing as, as the baby grass. And so they're right back there cropping again. Now you can imagine as long as the cow is allowed to do that, it'll continue doing that. And if you're in a fairly arid area where there's not a lot of rain, you'll kill that root and all of a sudden you'll start seeing bare ground. And then it'll go and extend that operation to the next most favorite. And gradually more and more bare ground will grow and you're seeing desert desertification happening. Uh, now, of course, if you have lots of rain uh, as we tend to do here on the coast, uh, you're not going to really see much desertification but instead of producing huge amount of forage because you mainly leave that grass to get into that teenage phase and you actually want to keep it in the teenage phase it, where it's growing really fast, um, the, that, that the advantage there is that uh, because it's growing so fast, uh, it can in fact produce a lot more grass uh, which can then support up to four times as many cows on the same pasture size. Now, how do you get to keep the cows away uh, so to allow the grass to recovery? So it's the recovery time for the plant that should be your primary focus. Um, and so what you can do is you can take that pasture, uh, which uh, maybe it was, you know, four acres in size and you had four cows there um, you can carve it up into, um, you can take an electric fence, for example, and make a paddock in that big pasture, uh, which would be much smaller. So imagine you were, imagine you were dividing it up into about 30 to 60 paddocks. And you then put all of your cows into that one paddock and you allow them to stay there for about a day, not much longer. And that gives them a chance, well, because they're more concentrated, uh, there's a bit more competition involved. So they're now not just spending the time going after their favorite, they're competing for whatever is there and making sure they get their bite in before the next guy does or the next gal does. And uh, then before they, uh, after they've taken off about 40% of the grass and trot on the rest maybe, you then move them to another uh, electric fenced paddock mm -hmm. and you continue to cycle through that pasture and don't return to the paddock that you were just in until it's had a chance to fully regrow. And then it's ideally ready for the cattle to come back. So this is the, the general idea that the, the secret to uh, holistic grazing is you have to take a very close attention to the uh, recovery time of the grasses. And that's the sort of central guiding factor. So it can be done. Oh yeah. <laughs> okay, thank you. I see a couple of questions in here that kind of have a similar answer. The one about slugs being a problem with straw and um, uh, letting, 
uh, plants go to seed and things like um, comfrey. So a lot of people don't like comfrey in their garden because it spreads easily. But comfrey is the most wonderful plant. It produces reams of beautiful green stuff that will build soil that you can use to build soil. You just have to cut it back right down to the ground. You can cut it back like four or five times a year and then it's not going to go everywhere in your garden. And then you use those leaves, you put them on your soil and they decompose really quickly. They feed the soil. Um, and so, yes, slugs, we have slugs in this part of the world. We have tons of slugs here. When we first went to the, the um, Grafton Agricultural Commons last year, there were, every time we went there, we would pick up a pick up hundred slugs. And, um, but really it's, it's those little sort of things that seem like a problem really aren't a problem in the long run. And so what you want to want to do is focus on building the health of the soil and gradually your ecosystem will come into a balance and there will be predators that will keep things under control. So you won't have like huge quantities of slugs. So what I really suggest is you watch the film called The Biggest Little Farm. It really explains that principle well. And it shows how over a period of seven years, how they move from having all sorts of problems to eventually having a balanced ecosystem. All right, thank you so much. Um, we are gonna have to wrap up. I know there's, if I maybe have a quick question about um, sea soil, if you have thoughts on sea soil. Yeah, well, um, I tried really hard to get good information about sea soil because I was concerned that it came from fish farms. And um, so I couldn't get anybody to deny that it came from fish farms, nor say, so I, I don't use it. Um, if you can find out it, where it comes I from. Had a, I had a similar um, concern and contacted them last year and the response they gave me was that they did not because I also didn't want to use it for that reason. Yeah. But check again, right? You never know, things yeah. can change. Yeah. Um, where do you buy comfrey? Well, I got mine from the back lane of our, and I plant, dug it up from the back lane, someone's weed growing there and planted in our garden. And now I actually know what I'm supposed to do with it. So thank <laughs> you. So look for someone else who has it because it grows like crazy and you can yeah. probably yeah. buy seeds from yeah, somewhere you and start it or try to get it from someone else. It grows really easily. That's why some people don't like it in their garden because you, you have to tend it. If you don't tend it, then it will go everywhere, right? But all you have to do is cut it back four or five times a year. That's what tending it is. Uh, can we squeeze in one last question about horse manure? Um, horse manure is great as long as the horses haven't been deworm have deworming medication. So you have to ask, and it, and it's hard to find people who don't deworm their horses or or only deworm their horses if they have a problem. And so then you just don't use their manure for a certain period of time. But, but most, mostly now in stables, horses get dewormed on a regular basis. And um, so their manure is, you know, filled it, with it's, chemicals. It's, it's really hard on any microbes in the soil. And if you want to grow regeneratively, you've got to maintain the health of the microbes. And it's just tragic what it can do to the microbes. Mm -hmm. But you know, other there's also you know goats make great man manure and uh, chickens and there's lots of different kinds of manure. But yeah, horses you have to watch out for the uh, the deworming medication. So I think uh, we will have to wrap up. There's so much to learn. I think you've given us a great start of knowing the principles and some great resources that we can all look into. And we really appreciate your time and sharing your journey. You've covered so much in six years and it's so wonderful that you're sharing it with all of us so we can keep, keep nurturing that. And you've given us a lot of food for thought. So I'm gonna pass it over to Josh to wrap up for us. Uh, yes, so thank you uh, very much, Jackie and Phil, and thank you everyone for uh, joining us tonight. We'd love to get any feedback if we can. Um, 
if you have any ideas or requests for future topics, or if you'd like to get more involved um, or hear about our future events, you can go to the uh, North Shore for our kids webpage and add your email address through the I'm in button. It's uh, really helpful if you do this as it gives us a bit more information about how involved you wanna be and puts you on our mailing list. We'd also, uh, we also will follow up with an email with a recording of the uh, session tonight and ways to become involved. Um, so you can reply to that email. Our next monthly Meet the Expert session will be on Thursday, May 27th with Unbuilders as our guest expert. And I'll just conclude by highlighting some of our recent campaigns. Uh, first, our Old Growth Forest campaign. As Julia mentioned, today we did uh, banners and we made it to into the North Shore news with our poster on Bowen Ma's office. And uh, we'll continue to set up meetings with our MLAs and other MLAs to pressure the government to follow through on their commitment to defer the logging of old growth. We're also working with our local city councils to have them table a motion to demand an old growth logging deferral from the government. Uh, finally, we'll continue with our divestment campaign and are in the process of putting together a submission for Bill C-12, the Climate Accountability Act in collaboration with the larger For Our Kids Collective. So thanks again to everybody and uh, hopefully we'll see you again at future events.